Bienvenue and welcome to Lafayette's 1824 Fairfield Tour of America, a conversation commemorating 200 years of the American French narrative with Roger Mummert. My name is Renee Ketchum and welcome. The Federation des Alliances Francaises, AFUSA, is the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French. Here's a little video to explain. Go to AFUSA.org and take a look at some of the great programs we have coming up with French Cinema Tech. Um, we have Miss Morgan's book, book Brigade about Anne Morgan that will be a fascinating conversation with the author and myself. And again, some wonderful French Cinema Tech films. Um, so go to AFUSA.org. A few logistics and format. Um, please stay on mute during the presentation and stay on speaker view. If you could put all questions in the chat, it would be great. And if you have technical issues, please sign back in after a couple of minutes um, using the original Zoom link. This event is being recorded to share on our national YouTube channel and the total runtime is one hour. I am thrilled to introduce AFUSA board member Bryn Valor. He is a member of the board of the Alliance Francaise of Minneapolis St. Paul. He is also a member of the board of directors and corporate secretary of the Fédération des Alliances Françaises USA. Bryn is a retired corporate lawyer and law professor. He has a BA degree in French and JD degree from the University of Minnesota. And welcome back, Roger Mummer. We have just <laughs> loved his program, programs in the past. Um, Roger is the creator of the ParisProject.net, which explores the history of Paris as a city of ideas. Alliance Francaise national presentations include Paris, a city of ideas, and Myths and Mysteries of the Bastille. Both are available on our YouTube channel. Recently, Roger recently presented D-Day and the Soul of France at the Embassy of France in the United States. His writing on culture, literature, and travel can be found in the archives of the New York Times and elsewhere. Alors, je vous donne la parole, Roger. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Renee. And uh, thank you to Melissa and Bryn as well. It has been a pleasure to work with the Alliance Francaise uh, these uh, last several years. Uh, I must say... My first stop in Paris was to find a place to stay. My second stop was the Alliance Francaise in Boulevard Raspail, and it, that's where um, it helped me to refresh my high school French, and uh, it was a wonderful experience, Alliance Francaise. So this is the fourth in a series of presentations, all of which we were just talking about have largely to do with the relationship between France and the United States. Our common uh, revolutions would have, which have very much in common with certain uh, uh, differences. Let me begin also with a caveat to say that uh, I'm not a historian. Many of you may know more about the history of uh, the Revolutionary War than I do. I uh, am not an anthropologist. I'm not a linguist, but I'm a journalist. And a journalist uh, trades on or pretends to have skills from all those different areas. I look to find the best sources I can to suss out what is the real narrative behind the story and then to tell a story. And our story today is a topic that it couldn't be more topical. We're going to be talking about re-examining the foundational national values of a country in the midst of a presidential election, one that in fact is contested and will be settled uh, by uh, a decision of the House of Representatives in 1825. So we begin with General Lafayette's, the Marquis de Lafayette's Guest of the Nation Tour. In 1824, as the United States neared the 50th anniversary of its founding, Gilbert de Mottier, the Marquis de Lafayette, was invited to return to American shores as a guest of the nation. And thus began Lafayette's farewell tour of America. Over 14 months, he visited all 24 states of a growing nation, and everywhere people gathered to give thanks to Lafayette, known as the General, or the Marquis, or more gloriously, the Hero of Two Worlds, 
for his critical role in both the American and French revolutions. It was a tour to beat the band. Lafayette was greeted with cannon fire, flotillas of ships, military salutes, marching bands, children's choruses, and banquets of breathtaking splendor. He shook hands with mayors, governors, and six American presidents, present, former, and future presidents. Lafayette reunited with aged veterans from his campaigns, some he remembered by name. He embraced them, blessed them, and invoked the memory of all those who had taken part in birthing a nation, many of whom had fallen along the way. In Terry's speeches, Lafayette was heralded as a savior of democracy for his selflessness in fighting for and in helping to finance the American cause throughout the war. A grateful nation gave thanks to Lafayette. Songs were composed, odes were recited. In city, town, and village, Lafayette's presence created pandemonium, and he left a lasting mark. Parks, squares, schools, towns, and counties were named for Lafayette. And even in today's cancel culture, when many statues have come down, the name Lafayette largely remains intact. Can we go to the next slide, please? And there was merch. <laughs> of course, souvenirs of the farewell tour abounded. There were Lafayette ribbons, fans and gloves and printed with his image, and platters, posters and knickknacks, tchotchkes and gewgaws of all sorts. The joyful celebration of the nation's guest was infectious. Next slide, please. Over the course of Lafayette's farewell tour, our nation elected a new president in a contested election, and France saw the death of one king and the coronation of another. Well, for Lafayette, this glorious farewell tour was just one more chapter in a panoramic life that spanned a momentous time in human history. Lafayette was born noblesse de l'épée, that is, he was a nobleman of the sword. His destiny was military. But early in his life, he became an orphan, one with a large fortune. He became an adventurer by his late teen years, a patriot and benefactor of the American Revolution, fighting alongside George Washington, George Washington at just age 19 and 20. He was a hero then of the French Revolution, a decade later, heading the National Guard and uh, being master of ceremonies at Fête de la Révolution. After that, he uh, fell from favor uh, as, a, uh, as a supporter of constitutional monarchy. And as that fell out of favor, he went into exile one step ahead of the guillotine in all likelihood. He returned to France and uh, he was a, a representative of the Liberal Party during Empire and Restoration. And in 1824, he was invited as a guest of the nation to come and be a defender of liberty and expressed himself also on his tour as a confirmed abolitionist. Afterward, the, uh, Lafayette had some role in the subsequent uh, revolution of 1830, but he became largely a fading memory in France. But in this country, he was forever glorified. Indeed, Lafayette arrived in America a hero and departed a myth. All in all, not a bad 68th year for the hero of two worlds, who otherwise would be, like his own hero and father figure George Washington after leaving office, just a private citizen back home sitting under his own vine. Now, let's talk about some of the celebrations that were part of this two-year, or rather 14-month tour in 1824-1825. On August 15th, Lafayette sailed into New York Harbor, and he was met with uh, hordes of people just joyous at his arrival. He was uh, he was heralded uh, or feted with several spectacular celebrations. Two of them, a week apart, were at Washington Hall. The first was hosted by the French citizens of New York. Lafayette was heralded uh, to the to the memory of those who died for the cause of freedom from 1789 to this day, invoking, of course, the French Revolution. There were shouts of "Vive la Liberté! Vive Lafayette!" A week later, the Grand Lodge of Freemasons in New York put together a spectacular uh, dinner for him, also at Washington Hall, with flags that cited liberty, victory, and Lafayette. A table was constructed with an enormous 70-foot-long model of the Erie Canal, the Erie Canal being one of the wonders of the age. It was made of wood, 
filled with leather, uh, lined with lead, filled with water, and grass was growing around the borders. In the center was an enormous rotating sun. But all these celebrations paled in comparison with one in between, September 13th, at Castle Garden. Can we go to the Castle Garden? Uh, next slide, please. Ah, now Castle Garden was built as a fort in the harbor of New York to defend New York against the British in the War of 1812. Um, it was freestanding. It really was not connected to the lower Manhattan. It is now. Uh, the remains of it are still there. And interestingly, it was a fort for a very short time. And then it became, in 1821, an entertainment center. There were opera uh, performances here. And uh, it was a site of great uh, entertainment. And in 1855 until 1890, it became the immigration center for New York. My grandmother and her mother came through Castle Garden. This was before Ellis Island was built around 1890. And it's now known as Castle Clinton, and it's part of Lower Manhattan, at least part of it, uh, remains uh, down in, uh, in Wall Street. So on September 13th, there was a magnificent fete, weeks in the planning, and it surpassed in taste and brilliance everything done for Lafayette so far. The fort was 600 feet wide. It had a 60-foot vaulted ceiling. Um, there was a bridge 300 feet long, lined with luxurious carpets, bordered by trees. In the middle was a 75-foot pyramid, and it held 6,000 people who paid $3 admission each. This was a major thing. There were flowers and flags of all nations. The uh, event was lit up by a 1,000 torches. And when Lafayette entered, the song was played, See the Conqueror Comes. Curtains were raised, revealing a view of a thousand boats in the harbor. A transparency of Lagrange, his home in France, uh, was lowered and uh, with the inscription, this is his home. Time appeared short to us, uh, it's written in Lafayette's journal. We were astonished to hear signs of departure at 2 a.m. Uh, a steamship bound for Albany met us at the breakwater. This is the steamship outside of Castle Garden that's going to take him up to, up to Albany. We boarded, but the partiers delayed our departure with embraces. The sound of music and revelry faded away as we steamed up the Hudson. Next uh, slide, please. Perhaps the most heartfelt part of the entire 14-month journey, the tour of uh, America, came at Mount, Mount Vernon and Yorktown. Of course, Mount Vernon was the home of George Washington, the, the, the father figure of Lafayette, who at this time had been gone about 25 years. It was very emotional for uh, Lafayette to return to Mount Vernon and then to Yorktown, where there was a kind of reenactment of the great battle uh, that led to the uh, surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. It's written in the Alexandria Herald and also the Richmond Herald in October of that uh, 1824 year, an account of how they went. Sunday, 11 o'clock, they embarked on the steamship Petersburg for Yorktown. There were nine rounds of hearty cheers. When they landed at York, uh, Mount Vernon, they remained for an hour. The tomb of Washington was opened. A ring containing a portion of his hair was given to Lafayette by Mr. Custis of Arlington. That's George Washington's step-grandson who delivered what was described as a pathetic address. Now, that's a different use of the term pathetic, meaning uh, evoking emotions. But here was the last of the generals in the art in the Army of Independence, and standing at the grave to pay uh, respects, uh, a manly and affecting tribute of a patriot and a soldier's tear. Lafayette then was presented with a Masonic sash with a medal that had belonged to George Washington. The sash was cut into pieces and given to children in the area. General Lafayette, we were informed, was very much affected during a short stay at the tomb. It's written in his journal, when the vault was opened, the general kissed the leaden cells, which contained the ashes of the great chief and venerable consort, and then re he retired in an excess of feeling, which language is too poor to describe. Whoever visits the tomb will find its laurels moistened by the tears of Lafayette. This is kind of typical of the uh, reports that you'll read in, uh, in newspaper accounts of the time. Very flowery, uh, very emotional, very almost purpley uh, in their prose. The group then spent an hour inspecting house and garden. Not a thing had changed in the house. Lafayette found a key he had given to George Washington, a key to the Bastille, that monument of despotism. Then the group, which consisted of Lafayette, his son, George Washington Lafayette, his, um, as, uh, his secretary, Le Vassier, and a, uh, a, an assistant, uh, Bastien, um, the group walked back, back the path to the river, each holding a branch of cypress,
cut from the tomb of George Washington. Uh, last month, uh, as Renee mentioned, I was at the uh, embassy in Washington, the French embassy, and they have a very uh, piece of that sprig uh, uh, with a, a painting of, uh, of Mount Vernon that's on display in the embassy uh, uh, residence. It was amazing to see that. There was one other sidebar to the reports that were in the paper in the Alexandria Herald. It's written a very remarkable fact. On the passage of Benner Lafayette to Yorktown, an eagle, we see it at the top left there, the bird of Jove, flew over the bluff, hovered over the steamboat Petersburg, followed him to Mount, Ven Mount Vernon, continued flying over the tomb of Washington. It seemed to have inspiration in its actions. It would not quit the scene. A special messenger sent to welcome our illustrious guest on his visit to the sacred repose of the first of men, his friend and the friend of mankind. After the general had fulfilled his pious devotions, this bird, representing the gratitude of the nation and emblematic the spirit of Washington, took its final departure. Next, uh, La uh, Lafayette and his group, uh, well, let's, let's go back to one slide. They uh, traveled to Yorktown. And there, in a procession of six beautiful steamboats, decks crowded with passengers, there was martial music and landing to the thunder of artillery. He was greeted by the governor of Virginia, who gave an address, and as a, a, he really hit all the notes that are typical of these speeches. He uh, cited the consistent friend, in gratitude we speak, in the blood of the nation, indebted we are, our defender in our hour of greatest trial. The nation's feelings come directly from the heart. Next address was by B.W. Lay, who again cited gratitude, affection, veneration, emotions swelling in every breast. Almost all of these encomiums seem to have um, uh, chests that are bursting and hearts that are full and uh, heaving bosoms even. You, sir, you read your history in our nation's eyes. A whole people unite in one glowing sentiment of respect and love toward you. The young have been taught from the earliest time to honor and bless your name. We greet you as a bosom friend of Washington. We greet you as one of the fathers of the Republic. Next, they visited the tent of Washington, the actual tent they pitched on the lawn. And they also had assembled obelisks 76 feet high. And there was a flag of 50 feet long that was uh, unfurled. General Taylor then gave an address and said, On yonder hillock, the last scene of blood was closed by the surrender of an army and the liberty of our nation was permanently secured. Now, Lafayette typically was very, um, very moved uh, by all of these, uh, these greetings and these encomiums. And his response was typically uh, very respectful and very brief. Also, he said, I'm happy to receive these honors of friendship where the United Arms of America and France have been gloriously engaged in a holy alliance to support the rights of American independence and the sacred principles of the sovereignty of the people. There were, after that, uh, all, uh, all kinds of rejoicing are noted. There was a uh, banquet at which typically there were toasts, official toast numbered 13, I guess, after uh, the colonies. And then there were endless numbers of what they called volunteer toasts by different uh, military uh, volunteer groups and so forth. And as he left, they wanted him to stay. They, they wished that he could stay till it should please God to call you to himself. In every house, you'll find a home in every heart, a friend. Okay, this brings us to a discussion point. And Bryn, I want you to yeah, jump in I mean, if you would. Yeah, Roger, you pointed out the fact that Lafayette's profile was different. In the United States, he had a mythical status. And in France, over the course of the revolution, he tried to steer sort of a middle course and ended up kind of being driven from France, even spending five years in an Austrian jail in Belgium here, although he was elected to office when he came back to France. Now he retired. So why did Lafayette come back to the United States in 1824? Was it just to uh, to, to to bask in the glory? Well, perhaps so. Uh, you mentioned one key word there, retirement. Uh, that's something he did a number of times throughout his career. He retired from the military. He came back to take part in the events leading up to the revolution, he came back. He was named uh, head of the National uh, Guard during the revolution. Um, he fell into disfavor afterward. He fled the nation, was uh, imprisoned, as you said, came back to the nation, got back into politics. But in 1824, the uh, flag of the Liberal Party was very much in decline, and he was voted out of office. So, yeah, he was retired by the voters uh, in his country. So he had fallen into 
uh, well, he had fallen uh, into uh, not obscurity, but his popularity was really at the lowest point in his life. Now he came to America and found that his popularity here was at the highest point ever. And uh, did he bask in the glory? Certainly he must have been. It must have been um, very gratifying and validating for him to come back and to be identified with the qualities of of, of liberty and, and self-rule that are at the foundation of this country and of France also. So, yeah, he had time on his hands. <laughs> he, he, uh, what, a, what about yeah. from President Monroe's standpoint? I mean, what did he stand to gain? Was it just going to be a big party and that was going to contribute to his popularity? Or why did he invite Lafayette to come back. Yeah, I think much like Lafayette, Monroe had legacy on his mind. If we go to the next slide, we have a, we can jog through uh, Monroe's years. He was uh, president from uh, 1817, 1825. So in 1824, um, he was on his way out. And um, interestingly, Monroe uh, was the last of the founders. The end of the Virginia dynasty, four out of our five first presidents were from Virginia and slave owners all. So he was at the end of this dynasty and he was at the end of um, a period of two party um, friction or two party. Um, uh, 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 well, how shall I say um, the Democratic uh, Republicans and the Federalists were had been at odds now for the better part of 50 years, and they were coming to the end of that. The Democratic Republicans had largely won out. Um, now, Monroe was known for the Monroe Doctrine, which challenged European nations not to engage in colonialism in our hemisphere. But he'd also gone through a lot of some rough times, the Panic of uh, 1819, the Financial Crisis, the Missouri Compromise, that extended slavery, uh, much uh, controversy over that. Um, and I mentioned the Democratic Repart uh, Republican Party. And he had done a goodwill tour following the War of 1812, which had been very divisive in this nation. And he did a tour largely of uh, New England, where there were factions in New England that felt so upset, were so upset by our uh, our behavior or our strategies in the War of 1812, that there was talk of secession, secession. Massachusetts was going to leave the nation. So he went in 1817 to New England and um, and he did a, a used his personal charm, a charm offensive in a goodwill tour. It was very successful. And uh, so here, let's do it again with uh, Lafayette, uh, do it with a little bit of French charm as well. Uh, so, and so, so goodwill it, tours yeah. were something that was being done. To, had, had Lafayette ever done a tour before, or did he just wait for forty-five years here? Or so yeah, he, he had indeed. Um, Lafayette was in. Um, he was in America four times. He was here in 1777 when he came and fought alongside George Washington. He went back to France for a year. He came back 1779, uh, and then in 1784. After the war, at the signing of the uh, uh, Treaty of uh, Paris, the war was officially over. Why he came back and did a goodwill tour of the United States. He toured all nine states, and he was heralded again as a, the hero of two worlds and and uh, and the torchbearer of of liberty. So uh, that went extremely well. Now, when he was released from prison in 1799, that uh, Napoleon got him out of prison. He had really wanted to go to America. He really saw himself and his family going there and beginning a new life in the land that he loved. He was told not to come because relations between France and uh, and the United States were uh, uh, were in a bad uh, spot. There had been a kind of, uh, well, they called it the non-existent war, the invisible war. There was a war between the two fought uh, largely on um, on the seas. So relations were poor between the two nations, and Washington told him, don't come at this time. Also, Jefferson advised against it. So he didn't come uh, for another 24 years. He was very eager to get back to the nation that he had helped to found, the nation that he really loved. So that was Lafayette's uh, reason for doing so. And Monroe, as I said, had legacy in mind, probably. And the election of 1824 was going, and it was very contentious. There were four um, there were four um, candidates running, and uh, it, the um, the uh, newspapers were reporting this uh, in a, in a way that was was very distasteful, very vicious, uh, fighting back and forth. But as Lafayette came, he knocked the election off the front page, 
and helped to to reinforce what Monroe was promoting as his era of good feelings. You mentioned uh, earlier that uh, uh, Lafayette had very strong feelings regarding slavery and abolition. I know he also had strong feelings about treatment of Native American peoples in the United States. And here you see the Missouri Compromise under Monroe. It, it's This is starting to tear the country apart. How, how did Lafayette deal with that? Was he a firebrand or did he just do the best he could or what did he do during his tour? Yeah, if we can go to the next slide, this uh, shows some of his actions. Lafayette was, of course, a nobleman and a gentleman. And he did, not, I see no evidence that he stood up on any stage and said, I thank you for these kind words you said. Now, what about slavery? No, he didn't do it that way. He, he uh, however, made a point of meeting with many um, freed slaves, some abolitionists. Um, he met with many native peoples. I'm just reading an account of going into a, a native village and so forth, you know, and really tried to understand um, their experience and their disenfranchisement. And his tour came just about five years before the beginning of the Trail of Tears under Jackson, when 60,000 native people were marched out of the Carolinas and Georgia and forced westward into what became Oklahoma. Terrible um, um, chapter in our American story. Um, one other thing happened, and that was a reconnection with James Armistead. This is a fascinating story. James Armistead was born a slave, uh, or rather, I should say, an enslaved person in 1760 in, uh, in uh, Virginia. And his owner um, allowed him to join the Revolutionary War and to serve under Lafayette in Virginia. Now, Lafayette used him. He dispatched him as a spy to spy on the British. Now, you should know that um, the British announced that any any enslaved person who escaped could was welcome to join the British forces and would be given their freedom after the war. So some 5,000 um, enslaved people did so. And so uh, James Armist had posed as a runaway slave who had gone over to the British, and he went back and forth as a kind of double agent. Uh, letting Lafayette know that the British, uh, what, what their forces were doing, and then the, their reinforcements were coming by sea. And then he gave false information uh, to the British also. The British spent a great deal of time chasing after Lafayette, trying to capture this uh, this boy, as they called him, who was driving them nuts because uh, they, they, they couldn't figure out where he had gone. At the same time, why the reinforcements um, that were coming by sea were blockaded. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, so they never could reach the British forces. And this was instrumental in the surrender of the British at Yorktown. Now, on the 1824-25 tour, Lafayette saw James Armistead in a crowd of people. He, he pulled him out. He, he recognized him. And uh, they embraced and Armistead had gone back into slavery, unfortunately, after his whole experience. Lafayette wrote a letter to Congress um, asking for his uh, his uh, manumission, and he was freed in 1827. He later became a landowner. He had 40 acres and lived some years, not a lot of years after that. But he had the um, he had the joy of living a free life after uh, this event with Lafayette, and because of Lafayette, and he changed his name to James Armistead Lafayette. Incredible story. Um, so uh, Lafayette's embracing of, um, of uh, abolitionist views was well known. He also had suggested to Washington and Jefferson a kind of plan to gradually free the slaves of the South. And it was a plan to, and he wanted George Washington to invest in it with him in buying plantations and having the enslaved people work as employees and eventually gaining their and being educated and gain their uh, their freedom and so forth. Lafayette himself spent a lot of money buying a, a plantation in French Guyana uh, for this experiment, but uh, nothing much came of it in the end. But he had a grand plan that uh, he tried to convince George Washington of this. He had very strong views about this. Um, but as I said, I see no evidence that he uh, uh, from the pulpit or rather from the podium uh, made uh, a, a nuisance of himself in, in browbeating the American public. His actions were really private, uh, but well known. What about with respect to Native American populations? He had strong feelings about the treatment in North America of those populations as well. Yeah, yeah yes, he certainly did. And as I said, he uh, met with a number of uh, 
of uh, tribal chieftains. Uh, it was fascinating. And they recognized uh, in uh, Lafayette that someone who had fought on their behalf against the, the British, uh, if he had, and, and uh, they, um, here's a quote from Chief Mushal Atubi, a Choctaw chief, who said, you are one of the fa of our fathers that fought in the war with General Washington. We take you here by hand as a friend and father. They tended to call him father, which was really kind of interesting. So, uh, you know, there was there, there was a, a fascination with Native American culture um, uh, among uh, among the French, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, um, their, their system of 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 theology, their system of respect for the uh, for the forest, for the environment. These were things which really fascinated Lafayette. And he, and he made a, a point of trying to understand that. Um, now, did he have any effect on the treatment of Native Americans in this country? I can't say that he did, but uh, his views were well known. So remind us, you've kind of uh, given us a good sketch of what was going on in the United States. What was going on back in France? We've gone through the French Revolution. We've gone through <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte. We've had a restoration. What's what's happening in France while Lafayette's touring the States? Oh, a great deal. If we can go to the next slide. Yeah. France in 1824-25 was in the midst of the Bourbon Restoration. King, I'm sorry, the King uh, Louis the Eighteenth um, uh, gave way to Charles the Tenth. So there was the change, uh, the death of the king, and the, and and the king uh, that replaced him was part of the Bourbon line. And there was a uh, there was a, a great friction between the ultra royalist party. Polignac was representative of that and the liberal left of Lafayette, as I said. So um, clearly, uh, France had gone through a great deal going from the ASEAN regime to the lead up of the revolution to the Revolution and Republic. Now, Lafayette was all part of these things, the empire and then the restoration. But this period uh, was one that's said to have been relatively uh, peaceful. There was economic prosperity. We were at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The Royalists had, were gaining favor over the Liberalists. And um, why um, it was a, a period of relative calm, although uh, it was not a period you could point to and say this is, it was not a period of Republic. It was not a period of true self-rule. Uh, self it was under constitutional monarchy. And um, as I said, there had always been a great fascination uh, of France as to what was happening in uh, in the New World, um, and uh, I think we'll get to that when we talk about the uh, the philosophes of the environment of the um, Enlightenment here. But let's go to uh, the next uh, slide, if we could. Yeah, well, you told us and you reminded us that uh, it was Ben Franklin who said that the America emerging from uh, the revolution was a republic, if you can keep it, was the perception that we'd kept it, notwithstanding a crazy 1824 presidential election. In slavery, yeah, cetera, cetera. it was it was far from assured. Ben was uh, right on the money there, and he still is, if we can keep it. <laughs> um, there was also the contested election of 1800, which was thought to have been a, a kind of crooked election that ended up putting Jefferson in office. There were many crises uh, that happened uh, over this period of time. So it was far from assured, even after 50 years, that our republic was going to survive. And in Europe, the bets were <laughs> that it would not. I think that European nations really felt, and this goes right up through the Civil War, where they really did not think that uh, America would survive, that finally it had come apart, and indeed it had, uh, and that a republic would not be on the far side of the Civil War. But at this point, there was fascination with this American experiment and, uh, and skepticism as to whether it might continue. But uh, there are common uh, values that came from this. And those common values, of course, are liberty and equality. And this is an interesting point. Uh, because Lafayette was a proponent of liberty and um, even more than equality. And it's often said that the uh, two revolutions had that in common. Of course, in France, you have three principles that came from that. But if you put aside for a moment the fraternité, which is a, a, a concept that most Americans don't have a notion of, the, the kind of universalism of, of, of Frenchness, um, 
the liberté and égalité are the two common uh, values that have come from both revolutions. Now, it's often said that in America, we often we 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 will always give greater weight to liberty than equality. And if you saw the uh, Democratic convention last week, the big word up there was was freedom. It wasn't equality. <laughs> it wasn't. But in France, um, liberté and égalité go hand in hand. And are considered as having both value, uh, both of equal value, and that has generally been true for both the left and the right. It's not in question. So um, those common values had been sustained by 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 bone, both nations, I think, at this point. But slavery remained obviously a bone of contention between at least continental France's thinking and and the United States. I think uh, worldwide it had become something of a bone of contention. I think there was really dismay that after 50 years, the uh, the United States still was uh, a nation that supported slavery. Now, you, uh, you, in, in France, of course, uh, the revolution eliminated slavery. It did come back under Napoleon. And there was a feeling also by France and to some extent by England that it was a necessary evil. That and this gets into further racial discrimination of uh, uh, horrific uh, notions that that uh, certain uh, peoples were better suited to the impossibly hot and humid conditions of raising uh, cotton and raising sugar cane that only Africans were prepared to do such a thing and so it was necessary but um, this issue of the economic place of of slavery um, is very problematic and. Uh, now, was Lafayette disappointed with the founders, uh, the four noted here, all presidents and all slave owners? I don't know. I don't see anything that would say, uh, you know, I, I'm very, uh, I, don't, I don't see that stated in anything that I've found. And that's not to say it, it wasn't. But uh, Lafayette was uh, always an optimist, I think, and always uh, a nobleman. He was always true to his class in a certain way. And... Um, was he disappointed with Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe? I, I, I can't say that that was true, but I have to be uh, candid and say I think he was disappointed with the United States at this point. And he, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, made mention of that. You said that uh, at, by 1824, newspapers all over the United States were thriving. They were beginning to be at least a political uh, mouthpiece all over the world or all over the United States. What did the uh, newspapers reflect about oh, Lafayette's oh. tours? Yeah, that's an interesting story. Newspapers began in this country and in France also. They began as pamphlets around the revolution and uh, often developed into full broadsheet newspapers, as you see here in the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, right there in the center is the Lancaster Intelligencer. That's my hometown newspaper. Dial back 60 years and uh, you'd see me on my bicycle delivery. I was a paper boy. Dial back 90 years and my father was too, delivering the intel every morning. That was a, an outgrowth of the Democratic Party. The uh, afternoon paper, the New Era, was the Republican Party newspaper. And they certainly were different in terms of their editorials and stuff. This goes back to 1780s um, when that was founded. And there were uh, newspapers uh, all over the nation. And... Um, by 1820, I've found that there were uh, at least 400 newspapers. They tended to be local. You see the Kentucky Reporter or the Boston Telegraph up there. Um, the National Gazette developed into the, I believe that developed into the Philadelphia Inquirer. There were a couple of papers that were, in a sense, um, that were um, national. Uh, the National Gazette, there was another one. They reflected uh, political parties. The Gazette of the United States was the Federalist Party uh, paper that started in 1789. The National Gazette was the Democratic Republican Party in 1791. So um, I was able to find records of uh, Lafayette's uh, whole tour uh, in in uh, in great number through newspapers.com. It's an adjunct to ancestry.com. If everybody's anybody's done that, it's it's a great source for this. A little tough to read some of these things, the way they're preserved and whatnot, but it's really fascinating because they reflect in incredible detail all the preparations that were done by the committees of appropriation, or rather the the, uh, the committees in each town, um, and uh, and and all of the folderol of the entry of Lafayette to each town and the bank of the banquets that were that were held there. 
Lafayette uh, extended his tour by 3,000 miles because uh, he got so many requests to visit so many towns and cities around the country, he felt he, he really couldn't say no to them. And everywhere there were reports of uh, Lafayette's entry and the kind of hysteria that came to that. Here are a couple of reports um, from newspaper accounts. Our youthful bosoms heave with emotion of gratitude. Here we are again with the heaving uh, bosoms of emotion and gratitude. And beholding you, whose name we have been taught to lisp with veneration. The present generation esteem and honor you, and millions yet unborn will love and venerate your name. Pilgrim warrior, illustrious champion of the fraternity of the human race, the influence of your example will extend beyond the tomb. You've grown from a magnanimous young man, lived to a good old age to see the people enlarge their borders, multiply and strengthen their hands, confirm their union in the reign of equal laws, and realize the best blessings of liberty and order. We join in this national chorus of spontaneous gratulations. Um, so every speech uh, was uh, largely word for word um, entered into the newspapers. Um, and it's just an incredible um, journey through not just uh, this tour, but also the language of America at this time. And here we see more of it. Uh, verses were composed. An ode to Lafayette, chief of the mighty heart, all hail, how art thou, thou, thou wasted on. Loud freedom thundering on the gale, our nation's choral song. Here's another on the left. We crouch to no tyrant, nor flatter the pride that to title and birth is too often allied. But the homage the brave may receive from the free, that homage, Lafayette, we render to thee. Who laid the proud usurper low? Who conquered our oppressive foe? Who struck the last decisive blow? Noble Lafayette. <laughs> so, so you see, uh, there were um, uh, poems and, and odes composed, some by children, some by students, some by, um, um, by uh, religious leaders and so forth. Everywhere, um, there were encomiums to the great Lafayette, who had selflessly uh, given himself to uh, this new nation and, and devoted his life to the uh, noble uh, principle of freedom. And all of this is is reflected in the newspapers. I said earlier that the newspapers were um, partisan. Uh, however, there was no partisanship that I could see in any of these accounts of Lafayette coming. Everyone was overcome with gratitude that the great Lafayette had come. He truly, as I said, he, he came already a hero, but he left as a myth. Um, and uh, it just goes on and on as he travels some 6,000 miles all around the country. Roger, you mentioned that he traveled on the tour with his son, George Washington Lafayette, but also with his personal secretary, Levasseur, who you mentioned his name. And Levasseur kept a record, right? In addition to the newspapers, we've got his own notes and diary, basically. Oh, we do indeed. And it's quite a journal. Um, there is uh, a current uh, issue that I have of this account. There you see the uh, the original Lafayette on Amérique, on Amérique. Journal d'une voyage aux États-Unis that was um, composed by this Auguste Lavasseur, his secretary, who later was a diplomat. He was quite a learned man and of the liberal persuasion like Lafayette. So he traveled along. He made notes every day, and then he fleshed them out each evening. And uh, it's said that Lafayette had a very direct hand in what was written. He really kind of controlled the narrative, if you will. And uh, there you see uh, it in French. On the right, I was uh, able to um, see a, an 1829 American version of this uh, at the New York Public Library. Fantastic to uh, be able to handle these materials. But it is uh, compiled into one journal. And uh, yeah, Lavasseur... Um, chronicled every day, virtually, of, uh, of the whole uh, journey. And uh, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty extensive. It's about a 600-page book. And um, a lot of it I could do without. He includes the articles of, of, <laughs> of the Constitution of Pennsylvania and so forth. You know, uh, he was fascinated with how government worked. And there's a great deal of that. There are very significant portions of the discussion of the outrage of slavery. And that's in this book is where you find um, Lafayette's views or and or uh, Levasseur's uh, views on on slavery expressed. So it's kind of an odd uh, voice to uh, to the journal itself. 
And it's it seems to be a kind of composite of Levasseur's direct thoughts and uh, and Lafayette's direct uh, direction on this. Uh, some of the most colorful entries come from the part of the country that probably was, you, you might not have imagined, it comes from frontier America, which at the time was Ohio, uh, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri. And uh, when General Lafayette was there going up the Mississippi, and apart from um, the uh, constant uh, drumbeat of, of banquets and toasts and, and speeches, why he had some time just to watch the river go by, so to speak, and was amazed at the uh, the wildness, the, the pristine uh, nature that was there. But the small towns um, were some of the most wonderful uh, occasions for him. They were so grateful for him coming through the town and just spending a little time. Sometimes he just got off his boat and shook hands with people by the side of the river for a while. Other times he came through uh, towns in stagecoach, uh, or rather in, in, well, horse and coach, let's say. And uh, even if it was in the middle of the night, the people came out and, and set off cannons and and wanted to spend time with the great Lafayette. Now, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's look yeah, at you mentioned You mentioned the Erie Canal, Roger. Yeah. And so what, say a little bit about the state of technology in America, but especially the state of transportation. After all, he did make it to 24 out of 24 states at the time. How did he get about? Yes. Well, uh, we go back to uh, one slide um, yeah, the Erie Canal was, uh, as I said, one of the wonders uh, of the age. And when he went over the Erie Canal in 1825, it was not even open yet. It was uh, just being completed. And he was in a hurry to get back to Bunker Hill for a commemoration that he was due back on toward the end of his tour. And he was allowed to travel on the Erie Canal. He was also fascinated with the Philadelphia Waterworks, which was the use of hydraulics to bring fresh water to the swampy area of Philadelphia that had uh, suffered a number of epidemics because of its of bad water uh, being consumed. Uh, in this case, Philadelphia was about 30 or 40 years ahead of Paris, which really didn't get around to purifying its water, its, uh, bringing purified water uh, or rather fresh water from outside the city uh, until the, the really the renovation of Paris under Houseman in the 1850s and 60s under um, um, that renovation when hydraulics were used uh, to bring in fresh water and also to uh, operate the, uh, the sewers. Now, ste steamship travel was a new thing, and steamship travel was revolutionary in that it turned the many rivers of the United States and the coastal areas of the United States into the highways of America. And about half of his travel, Lafayette's travel, was done by steamship. If we go to the next uh, slide, we'll see that um, Lafayette traveled four times to America, as we said, so he made eight crossings of the Atlantic, and each one of those crossings was by schooner, and it was really no quicker at the end than it was at the beginning. 30 to 40 days were required to get across the, the ocean by sail. Interestingly, uh, just a few years before his trip came the first hybrid sidewheel steamer to cross the Atlantic, the Savannah in 1819, um, and that was the beginning of steam travel across the ocean, which really revolutionized um, Europeans coming to the United States and, and, and vice versa. So that was steamship travel. Uh, also, on the next slide, we can see that by land, um, oh, well, steamships, we have record of about 12 different steamships that Lafayette traveled on, up the Hudson, down the, uh, the Potomac, uh, rivers in the south, up the uh, Mississippi, of course, and the Ohio River. Um, and some of these were quite glorious uh, ships, very nicely appointed. It was dangerous travel. Um, many of the boilers uh, exploded. In fact, Mark Twain's brother was killed in a, in a steamship uh, explosion on the uh, on the Mississippi some years later. And one of the steamships that uh, that Lafayette was on sank uh, on the Ohio River off of Kentucky. He was rescued. They uh, they were <laughs> rescued, and Levasseur was able to rescue uh, the notes, thankfully, of of his ex of the uh, of the tour. And they were escorted on another ship to Louisville, where they went back to some land travel. As you see, it was horse and coach. Um, but interestingly, uh, he was just a few years shy of the first passenger train that was uh, that was operated in the United States. Had he come 10 years later, he probably would have traveled a great deal by train. Also of note, the uh, was 
a project called the National Road, I believe it was conceived under Jefferson, but it was begun in 1806. I'm sorry, it was authorized by Congress 1806, begun 1811, and it extended westward from Cumberland, Maryland. It was known as the National Road or the Cumberland Pike or the Cumberland Road. And it was the first such national, the forerunner, I guess you'd say, of the interstate system that eventually went to uh, the Mississippi River and then eventually went to the whole West Coast. And there was one entry where uh, Lafayette and his... Um, and his entourage are traveling eastward on this national road near Pittsburgh. And there are, as it was described, multitudes of immigrant people going the other direction, westward to the frontier of Ohio and beyond to settle this new American frontier. Wow. So while Lafayette is enjoying mythical status in the United States, how does the rest of France view the United States in 1824? Well, as I said, the French were always fascinated with America, going back to the Enlightenment philosophers who believed, let's look at Rousseau on the left, who uh, believed that there was a kind of purity of uh, of life and freedom in the jungle, in the, in the forest primeval, before it is uh, corrupted by the state and the church, and a social contract must be must be forged to exchange ultimate freedom for living in a society. Diderot was fascinated with uh, with America as well, um, and but did he was in favor of the revolution, but he did not uh, um, live. Uh, but he he did he did not uh, he thought that there would be a, there would be an uprising of of the enslaved people. The slaves would rise up and the native peoples would as well. Now, of these enlightened philosophers, their America was largely an imagined America. None of those four, Voltaire, Montesquieu, uh, Rousseau, Diderot, ever set foot in America. Um, all but Montesquieu saw Voltaire, Rousseau, and Diderot lived to see the beginning of the French Revolution. No, I'm sorry, of the American Revolution. None of them uh, lived to see the French Revolution that they were largely credited as being the inspiration for in many ways. Next came a group of adventurers, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, with his uh, seeking his his uh, fortunes in 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 his military uh, conquests, and the Marquis de Chateauloup, who fought alongside him, um, and there were several other French who uh, came to America. Spent a Crevecourt lived here as a farmer and wrote a book about being a, a French farmer in America. Brissot traveled here in the late eighteenth um, um, century. Next came a group I would call the observers. Just six years after Lafayette returned to France came Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, one of the most famous books, uh, Democracy in America. You see it there uh, in the center. Uh, de Tocqueville was assigned uh, the task of coming to America with a colleague to study our prison system, to see what could be applied in uh, France from America, which was thought to really have a kind of uh, you know gold standard of prisons. Um, and he wrote a book that was far more than just about prisons. He wrote about society, wrote about American um, uh, government, and he wrote about slavery, too, faulting, as Marquis de Lafayette had, America for the moral outrage of, of slavery, but also the economic idiocy of having such a large workforce beyond what was actually required, that there was a, there was a, it was a time bomb, you know, that, uh, that you couldn't have, especially in the, in the deep south of, say, uh, South Carolina, such a surplus, really, of labor. This was the period, of course, when slaves were sold south to uh, to be uh, um, to be put to work at the uh, plantations of the deep south with cotton and, and uh, sugarcane. Clemenceau, who later became um, prime minister twice, came to America in the eighteen sixties and wrote about it with great fascination. He was of a leftist uh, a viewpoint at that time, um, and uh, he wrote for a. Uh, a French newspaper, Dispatches from New York, when he was a young man. There were others who wrote uh, histories of, uh, of the United States. And in contemporary times, we see the example of uh, Duchamp, the artist who came to America, lived, was here about 40 years, became a, a U.S. citizen, I believe. And the very interesting uh, case of Sanche de Gramont. Sanche de Gramont was a French nobleman who we're talking about in the 20th century, in the 1950s, uh, came to America, went to school here, and lived a kind of bi, uh, bicultural life of being sort of half French and half English until he, I'm sorry, American, until he finally fully converted to being an American and renamed himself Ted Morgan. 
Morgan being uh, kind of a version of Gramont, he said. <laughs> and then finally, I would mention a contemporary, Bernard-Henri Levy, who 20 years ago wrote a book called American Vertigo, you see at the right there, Traveling America in the Footsteps of de Tocqueville. And um, he didn't exactly follow Tocqueville's footsteps so, so much, but he went to the American West. And the book is filled with a lot of uh, observations typical of, uh, of Levy, a kind of... Uh, uh, a kind of a landslide of ideas all at once about uh, way, the ways in which America works and what it means to be an American. So long did the French um, have a fascination with what went on in America. Uh, skeptical many were as to whether the American experiment would uh, would succeed. Um, of course, uh, France had by and by and large uh, financed a great deal of our uh, revolution. And that's a whole separate uh, story as to what the feelings were that uh, uh, France had kind of bankrupted itself with uh, with the help of Lafayette in uh, in fighting this war against uh, in, uh, in supporting the American forces against their their long term enemy, of course, England. So, so uh, it's it's a complex story, but but it's a long and and very uh, colorful one. Uh, he lived Lafayette for another nine years after. Uh, he, completing his tour, died in 1834. Uh, compare and contrast the uh, observation of his death in France and in the United States. Yes, uh, very different indeed. Why Lafayette returned after his tour, uh, went back into uh, <laughs> went back into legislature, um, had a very uh, brief role in the 1830 uh, July uh, Revolution. And as, again, being the head of uh, the National Guard, but then he once more retired to uh, to his home in LaGrange in the countryside and lived out his last couple of years as a kind of farmer, um, um, much in the in the style of George Washington. In fact, LaGrange was sort of modeled on uh, Mount Vernon. But then came his death. Uh, he had a series of complications, pneumonia and so forth, and he died at age 76, a very long life. And uh, at that time, uh, we're under the July monarchy of Louis Philippe, the so-called citizen king. And uh, this was shortly after uprisings in 1830 and 1832. And Louis Philippe did not want there to be any real fall to roll that might lead to an uprising again on behalf of Lafayette. And so he managed his whole funeral. He gave him a military funeral, said there would be no um, oratory afterward, no orations uh, uh, to him, they uh, uh, there was a cortege that marched through Paris, and some 200,000 Parisians came out to see it. So it wasn't without note. They went to the Cemetery Picpus, which you see there at the uh, the the bottom. That's in the 12th arrondissement. I went there a couple of months ago, but it was closed. Very limited hours. It's a small cemetery known for a lot of nobility being buried there. And the grave of Lafayette is the main sea. Uh, and uh, notably, uh, his grave was covered with ground from Bunker Hill with soil that his son sprinkled on. He had taken that from the dedication of Bunker Hill, knowing that uh, he wanted it uh, on his grave so that he could be forever resting in part in America. Uh, so that was Lafayette's death in France. Now, in our country, it was a very big deal. President uh, Jackson at that time uh, called a double session of Congress, and there was a, a three-hour speech by John Quincy Adams uh, as a tribute to Lafayette, and there were um, there were oratories all over uh, the country. You see one, an oration to Lafayette there at the top uh, left in the publication called Pulpit and Rostrum. Couldn't help but mention that. That's a great name. I don't know if it's still on the uh, newsstand, but uh, there were, um, and again, I, I got these uh, in the uh, New York Public Library. You can see them. Um, there were orations in every um, in every part of the country uh, to Lafayette, and it started almost a kind of building boom of uh, statues and namings of places for Lafayette. It's part of his, his lasting... Um, his lasting uh, mark on America, um, even so during his yeah. his tour, uh, it, it said that uh, he the uh, Pennsylvania uh, the Pennsylvania State House was set to be torn down, but they needed a place for uh, for Lafayette to speak, so they preserved it. Um, so he had an effect on buildings in America. In fact, 
and um, and on a number of American writers, notably Walt Whitman, as a five year old boy met Lafayette at the naming of a of a, a library in Brooklyn. Lafayette approached him and picked him up and blessed him, and it made an impression on a little five year old. He later wrote a story about meeting Lafayette. James Fenimore Cooper met Lafayette in New York and was a devoted uh, protege of him. And uh, when Lafayette returned to France, James Fenimore Cooper went to went to France. He was there in Europe for seven years, lived with Lafayette for a while, his homes in Paris and Lagrange in the countryside. And he wrote two books that were, in a sense, connected to Lafayette, one directly discussing Lafayette and the other a kind of fictionalization of a tour of America by um, by a hero of the revolution. Now, uh, the question of the abolition of slavery, did his example make a difference? I can't say that it, it did, but he was um, a, a leading voice in uh, a movement that eventually um, led to the abolition of, of slavery that and the don't think of the civil war but um um he he was he was on the right side of history in in that regard uh there were revivals lafayette revivals throughout the 19th century and of course it's uh, famously said in both world war one and world war ii that american soldiers arriving in france had a, had uh, the practice of saying monsieur lafayette we're here we're back Meaning to repay the debt to Lafayette. We're at the end of our hour, Roger. Can can anyone live up to that myth? What is the reality of Lafayette? Even among the leaders of the American Revolution, some people were critical. Jefferson said he was needy of compliments. He had a canine appetite for popularity and and fame. Yes, indeed. Uh, in, in answer to the first question, living up to a myth is not something I'd uh, recommend anybody trying. And especially in our time when, you know, we're in an era where our, our public figures are no longer are mythical. They're human. And, uh, you know, as we saw at the uh, recent convention, well, at the Democratic convention, they uh, take great pains to say, this is who I am. This is where I came from. This is this has been my my beginning. Uh, a myth doesn't really say that, you know. So, and it, the um, the recordings of Lafayette's tour and, and the recordings of his historical uh, significance lead one to a kind of view of history called history from above. And history from above, the notion that great men make great speeches and rise to the occasion, meet the moment, and so forth. And this is how history progresses. Largely has fallen out of favor with historians and historiographers of the, 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 who look at this from a Marxist point of view or a deconstructionist point of view or a post-structuralist point of view. Uh, so this view of Lafayette uh, and the kind of depictions that we see here with the flags and the and the cockades and the the uh, this is the uh, Fête de la Révolution down here at the bottom. These these are things that uh, are are uh, awkwardly uh, viewed. Uh, they find an awkward place in our in our current view of history. So that has changed a great deal. Human, uh, you know, our hero worship in a time of human imperfection. So Lafayette is viewed very differently, and certainly in France, he's not viewed as a major figure in either in in French history. And uh, we were discussing this uh, our group. Um, and uh, it, the reasons why are very interesting. Some feel that Lafayette was simply too American to be part of the French or to be credited as being part of the French Revolution. His affinity with liberty was so much greater than his affinity for equality, as we talked about earlier, that he was seen as American influenced. And in terms of his long term belief, his lifelong belief, in his, his social class and nobility, he was a, a constitutional monarch to the end. And so he was seen as too um, monarchical for the liberals and is seen as too liberal for the monarchists, in fact. So he was a man in the middle and a man who did the displeasure of, of French intellectuals never really defined his ideology. It said that his only ideology really was class that he was a nobleman always, and that he was dedicated, yes, to the to the concept of liberty and to self-rule, but that he never, uh, you know, could step outside of his, his upbringing in a sense of privilege. So uh, there are those who fault uh, Lafayette for that. 
and more in France than here. I have never seen a uh, um, statue of Lafayette in, in Paris, <laughs> but, but I looked it up and there is one. It was um, put there. It was uh, actually a, a statue that was uh, uh, rendered because of Americans. There was a fund that was begun as a kind of thank you for the, uh, for the Statue of Liberty. And a statue was rendered and placed in the Cour de Napoleon in the center of the, the Louvre courtyard where the pyramid is now. It was moved down the line along uh, the uh, Seine near the, uh, I think, the uh, the Grand Palais uh, along the um, Cour de la Reine. Uh, I've not seen it, but I'm going to go take a look next time. Uh, there is a Rue Lafayette there, but his um, presence in Paris is is not a significant one in a town that where everybody else is. So that's a kind of a telling statement. But Roger, you, we're going to have to end yeah. our tour of the tour mm -hmm. right now because we've run out of time. But on behalf of the Federation of Alliance Francaise USA, on behalf of the entire Alliance Francaise network across the United States, thank you so much. This has just been a fascinating, fascinating tour regarding a very fascinating person. So, uh, Renee, do you need to do anything or shall we just say au revoir à tout le monde? I think we say a simple au revoir and thank you, Roger, as always, for mesmerizing us with the incredible facts and details that I hope other all chapters will share with their their audience. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bravo. Bravo. Okay.